next speaker is Jordan uh, Hendricks. He has his PhD at Cornell University. He's been a postdoc here for a couple of years, and he's been speaking to us on classification of astronomical time series in the synoptic survey era. So, as John says, I'm uh, in the Center for Time Domain Informatics here, and first wanted to thank everyone for coming to our conference. I think it's been a huge success getting people from different domains together to talk about all these interesting problems and see the areas of overlap. Uh, so, I just want you know, last talk of the conference. I want to tell a little bit more about what we're working on here. Um, obviously, Monday you saw Josh's talk. And uh, Dovey gave a talk this afternoon. There was a couple of posters out there about our work. Um, so specifically, the uh, majority of our work is classification of uh, time astronomical time series. So these time series come in different forms. Uh, typically, the data are not evenly spaced or noisy. Uh, the, the, the objects we're looking at can be transients where uh, something goes up in brightness, goes down in brightness, and then returns. Or it can be a variable star where things kind of go up and down in brightness forever, for millions of years at least. And so the idea is to, to make sense of all these data. The data can also uh, be either multi-band photometry, where you have uh, simultaneous, simultaneous time series in different formation bands, or single band time series. Uh, often the problems uh, revolves around making very quick decisions after seeing only a couple of measurements to try to figure out the, the best course of action. So there's a range of statistical and computational issues to deal with, and obviously uh, these problems are important, especially for the, the next generation of astronomical uh, telescopes. So this next, is there a laser pointer? Okay, I'm tall enough, I guess. So uh, <clears throat> the big headliner uh, telescope is a large, large uh, synoptic survey telescope, or LSST. It's <coughs> coming out in the end of the decade. And LSST will be observing, uh, will basically put a new point on the light curve of 800 million objects every three days. So every three days, it will scan the entire sky. So uh, we're not streaming in the, the second range, but every three days, we get a new measurement for 800 million objects. Um, so it's 20 terabytes of data per minute. Even before then, uh, we're, we're observing uh, th these photometric data, so brightness measurements of objects for uh, billions of objects. And making sense of this information, especially when, when uh, there's hundreds of classes of objects out there and trying to understand the best course of follow-up is uh, of utmost importance for us. So why do we need machine learning classification resources? There's, there's several uh, astrophysical uh, reasons that we would want this. First is just detecting and discovering objects in real time. So as Doby Plotnowski said earlier, we have this astronomical haystack and we want to pull out a couple of needles of things that are important for us, to, to, for the science that people are interested in. Along with this, uh, a related theme is optimal uh, allocation of resources. So typically we have kind of uh, an array of, of follow-up telescopes for which we, can, which we can use to observe kind of finer information about certain objects. But these are costly resources, and we don't want to be wasting them on objects that aren't important to the science that we care about. So the challenges in, in real time discovering the things or finding about the things that are most probable to be important for our science, and then dedicating other resources uh, to follow those up. 
related is that there are certain things which are transients which say explode, so we need to follow them up instantaneously, versus things that are pulsating for millions of years, which we can wait to get follow up. Uh, kind of a different problem is trying to come up with pure and complete samples uh, of objects to do cosmological or astrophysical studies. <laughs> so trying to understand the populations of different sources and using that to infer uh, certain things about cosmology or things, certain things about astrophysics. That's kind of more of the retrospective study, so after a survey's over, can we figure out all the, the things going on out there? Uh, what are the populations of, of objects? And how does that, what does that mean for uh, the composition of the universe? So, and then, of course, outlier detection, so finding things that we don't know about, which obviously we'd want to follow up on to try to discover what's going on. That's what we're doing. And so, discovery on these massive data streams is certainly not assured. You need really good machine learning algorithms to extract uh, the most science that you can out of. Uh, these next generation surveys. Okay, so I'll start by talking about uh, kind of the real time discovery and classification. You obviously heard about the real bogus problem earlier. Um, I'll give uh, another couple of examples of things that we're doing with the, the Palomar Transient Factory. Uh, so, this is the basic Palomar Transient Factory uh, uh, data flow. So, the initial observations are taken on a 48 inch camera. On Palmer Mountain. That information is sent to uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab where they do all the, prop the, the initial processing and the image extraction. Then that information is sent to us at Berkeley where we're using classification. And based on the results of that classification, the follow up marshal decides whether or not other telescope resources should be dedicated to each object. So the automated classifier it has several parts. The first is the real bogus problem that, that Adobe talked about. So for each of the million nightly detections, which ones are real? After we have an idea that something is real, we might want to know, is it a transient? Is it something that's going to go away? Or is it a variable star? Something that's going to be there for a long time? Or is it a quasar? Um, we also might just want to know, is it a supernova or not? And uh, based on what people in the collaboration, what the, the, the science of people in the collaboration is, uh, the marshal might, will we'll then decide, we'll take that information to decide whether or not something should be followed up. So Adobe talked about the, re the real bogus problem. I think we're on a similar problem, which is, uh, what we call the machine learned supernova zoo. And so, uh, we quickly mentioned the, the supernova zoo project where we actually have what are called citizen scientists. So, basically, members of the public can uh, subscribe to the service where they are given real telescope images. This would be the new image, the deep reference image, and subtraction. And they're asked a series of questions about those, uh, those images. And each candidate gets a score based on uh, what, what people opine on, uh, on each of the objects. So this typically, the, the, the typical turnaround time for this is about four hours. And we, what we want to do is build a machine learner that can do this instantly based on features that we have at the time of detection. So our, our question is, you know, could we actually do some supervised learning on this problem to instantaneously have, uh, instantaneously reproduce what the zoo would say. And so we did this. So the important thing is that we, we use only features that are that are available at the time of detection. So this includes the base, uh, images based on the, uh, sorry, features, features based on the images, uh, plus contextual features, maybe information from other surveys that are available at the time of detection. And we see a pretty good correspondence between what the people say, so the zoo score, versus we use a random forest classifier, which is just a, a probability, a random forest classification probability. And uh, 
It seems like the, the correspondence is pretty good. Uh, this takes order of seconds instead of four hours. And interestingly, we actually, in terms of finding real supernovae, we do a better job in terms of uh, false positives and misconnections. We dominate the classifier that's constructed just off of the, the people supernova uh, is used for. So it's kind of interesting. We, we've trained off of their scores without any, any, without any knowledge of which things were actually supernovae and which things weren't. It turns out we actually do better than them, presumably because we do something in a self-consistent way Whereas different people can say, uh, can opine differently uh, on, on the same, same object. So if you ran an object through the supernova zoo, you would get presumably a different uh, score each time, whereas uh, the random force is, is self consistent. Okay. And so that's kind of the, shows some of the, the real time classification that we've worked on. Uh, another, another big question is retrospective light curve classification. So as we get more time series information uh, about an object, instead of classifying you know, supernova or transient, this kind of cosmic versus everything else, we might want to go deeper and deeper into this classification taxonomy. So this is, gives you a sense of 150 types of uh, Variable uh, class, uh, variable classes for astronomical data. Uh, it's quite complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on out there. So uh, as we get more information, maybe we can have a finer and finer taxonomy. Uh, so in this particular project, uh, we try to answer, answer the question after getting more photometric info. So after Measure, monitoring the brightness of an object uh, over days instead of uh, using the information from a single day, can we, instead of just classifying supernova versus everything else, can we actually tell the type of the supernova? So supernova break into uh, half a dozen different types. And uh, there was actually a, a challenge recently um, issued by people from the Dark Energy Survey using simulated light curves to try to test whether or not people can actually reliably view supernova typing based on just this photometric information. So people are typically just concerned in finding which things are type 1a supernovae, because that tells us a lot about the cosmology of the universe. Um, so in our entry, we, so I, I should back I I should, I should up here. The data here are, are, are simultaneous time series in four different photometric bands. So each, the data from each supernova isn't just a single light curve, it's not a single time series, but it's a kind of four dimensional time series. And so our entry to this challenge was to try to uncover some sparse structure in these time series to do classification on. Uh, to use a semi supervised approach. Uh, first, I should say that in, in the challenge data, there is something like 20 times more unlabeled to labeled uh, supernovae. So, our idea is to use all the data to find an appropriate low dimensional representation of these time series and to use the labeled information to train a, a random forest classifier. Uh, the tool we use for this is something called Diffusion Map. Uh, so it's a it's a method for manifold learning for nonlinear dimensionality reduction, and the idea is to estimate the true discrepancy between individual data points based on a fictive Markov random walk on our data. There's a lot of uh, related methods such as local linear embedding, Laplacian eye traps. Uh, we've also used this in a, a couple other problems in astronomy. Uh, Basic way it works is so assume that you have uh, two dimensional data that actually reside on the spiral. And so if you were to try to, if you want to have a notion of, of distance between data points, obviously Euclidean distance doesn't work here because this and this have the same distance, even though the discrepancy between this and this 
is much smaller than the term C between this and this. So in the future map, we try to estimate uh, uh, the distance between points based on a random walk on the data, where in each step of that random walk, you're only allowed to kind of jump locally. So they from here to here, you can take a lot more steps than they did from here to here. <coughs> and so the way this works is by setting up the appropriate weight matrix. Um, the key here is that we really only need a sense of an appropriate local discrepancy measure. And often in local, uh, if you look locally, things you put in distance usually works pretty well locally, but not globally. So if you can determine appropriate delta here, uh, you just work out the uh, appropriate made the SVD of, of uh, the, the random block of, uh, transition probability matrix, uh, with the result being that Euclidean distances in this mapping, so the mapping is from uh, the original data to the, uh, the space defined by the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the transition probability matrix. The result is that the Euclidean distances in this space uh, pretty well approximate the fusion distances, which is based on uh, the transition probabilities of your Markov rank So it's a it's a great way of getting a sparse representation of really complicated data um, that, try to, that preserves the structure of the data set. Uh, so using data from the, the supernova challenge, so again, the input data are these four-dimensional time series, uh, sparsely sampled, uh, quite no easy. And so projecting in different diffusion map uh, coordinates we see that there's some structure here. Uh, we can build a classifier in this space, and it turns out the third and the seventh coordinates do pretty well, pretty good job of separating out the different types. Uh, we can also use this. So astronomers are always uh, interested in uh, what sort of astrophysical insight we can get from different representations of data. And so we can actually delve into these different coordinates and look into what exactly is changing in these time series as you step across the space. And that tells them kind of about the physics and maybe what sort of uh, insight we can extract from, from these different representations of the data. But of course, uh, if our goal is just to do classification, then this coordinate system uh, works pretty well. Uh, so just to, to end, I want to talk a little bit about uh, sample selection bias in astronomy. So it's a it's come up a couple times in this conference, the idea of sample selection bias, and it's it's certainly a, a big problem in astronomical data sets. So if, uh, looking again at the supernova challenge data, uh, the train set that we use in the challenge is drawn from this distribution of uh, redshift, which is distance from us, uh, versus brightness. So brightness is increasing this way. So the training set is an extremely biased look at the entire set, the entire population that we want to classify. So there's no reason to believe that building a classifier in this space is going to do any, what, any, anything useful in, in the, the other regimes of the data. So, uh, if, if you look at this, um, right, so this, this plot basically shows that if you, instead of using the training set that they gave you, if you actually use fainter limits, so assume a, a certain, okay, I have to take, take a step back that the training sets in astronomy are typically based on spectroscopic follow up of objects. So for spectroscopy, you need a lot more uh, time on your telescope. You need to point the telescope at the object for a lot longer than getting photometry, which is basically you take a, a picture of that object and you sum up the intensity uh, of that object. So it's very costly to get training data. It gets even costlier as you go to, to painter and painter limits. 
So you only you're allowed to so basically for a fixed amount of observing time, you're only allowed to you're allowed to observe less and less data and you get the fainter and fainter limits. So what we're probing here is let's assume different spectroscopic follow-up strategies and see how the supervised classifier uh, responds to them. So as we get to deeper and deeper limits, we're actually observing fewer and fewer training data. So I think the difference between kind of the brightest, so the extremes here are observe the brightest, only the brightest objects, versus take a random sample down to a very deep, a very faint limit. And so the, the, the difference between the total number of training data between here and here is like more than 200 or something. There's, there's a lot more. You're able to observe a lot more. You're able to spectroscopically observe a lot more data, a lot more objects if you uh, go to brighter limits. As you get fainter, you observe a lot less data, but your performance in the classifier improves dramatically simply because the sample selection bias gets less and less. So we try to make this a little more concrete. Um, and the, the, the method that we have determined works the best for kind of trying to overcome these uh, effects of sample selection bias is active learning. So active learning has come up uh, a few times in this conference, but the, the basic idea is to try to figure out the objects that if you had the, the, the true label, it would best help your classifier in subsequent iterations. And the key in astronomy is that we often do have the ability to selectively follow our sources. So, like I said, if you use spectroscopy, it's obviously expensive, but we have kind of a fixed amount of time that we can use to actually get the labels of objects. This is, a, I think, a key uh, point here that makes active learning a very viable option in doing these types of studies. And so, using random forest, we came up with a couple of heuristics of how you would want to use active learning to try to minimize the effects of sample selection bias. Uh, the first one being just simply choose the points that are most undersampled by the training data. So here, as a, as a proxy for density, we have uh, the proximity matrix of the random forest. Uh, sum over the unlabeled, so this would be the kind of the unlabeled density versus the labeled density. So if you look at that ratio, it gives you an idea of the effect of the sample selection bias. Uh, the second heuristic was pick the points that would back, maximally change the predictions of your random forest. And interestingly, you have a similar structure here that the summation over unlabeled data is still in the numerator, and it's the Kind of the density of the, the label data in the denominator. So I think that's kind of a neat result. And we show for, for a different problem for uh, variable star classification, you get dramatic improvements by doing just a few iterations of active learning. And I think Josh mentioned this on Monday, but we have a recently published uh, 28 class classification catalog of variable stars that uh, you can access. Okay, so I guess I'll end there. Um, I think the important point is that both astrophysical insight and machine learning expertise is really crucial in all the work that we've done. And I think that's been a main theme of uh, what other people have talked about too. And so I guess I'll, I'll do some other projects that we've been working on. But uh, I'll stop there and take some questions. We've got time for a question or two, and we can continue discussion outside of the lobby. What do you think about using simulated data to augment the paint side of the light curve training? Yeah, so I think that's a common approach in these types of data sets. Uh, again, there will be sample selection biases using simulated data. Maybe it's, I don't know if it's easier to, to characterize those biases that do occur, but I mean, if you do 
do reality 100%, you wouldn't have to observe. So using simulate, there's, there's always, you're, you're learning something with anything you do. Uh, I think astronomers typically prefer to use models because what they're really interested in ultimately is getting physical models for the things that they're observing. So I think one approach they often take is to just simulate the heck out of it and, and use that as kind of your true set. But I think you kind of end up in the same place. And I prefer to use real data. I think it's, I think it's more realistic. Yeah, I think we'll have to continue the discussion outside. Let's thank uh, Joy again. Uh, it revolves around making very quick decisions after seeing only a couple of renderings to try to figure out the, the best course of action. So there's a range of statistical and computational issues to deal with. And obviously, uh, these problems are important, especially for the, the next generation of astronomical uh, telescopes. So this next, is there a laser pointer up here? Um, obviously, Monday you saw Josh's talk, and uh, Dovey gave a talk this afternoon. There was a couple of posters out there about our work. Um, so specifically, the uh, majority of our work is classification of uh, time astronomical time series. So these time series come in different forms. Uh, typically, the data are not evenly spaced or noisy. Uh, the, the, the objects we're looking at can be transients, where our next speaker is Jordi Hendricks, who has his PhD from the University of Carolina University. He's been a postdoc here for a couple of years, and he's going to speak to us on classification of astronomical time series in the synoptic. Uh, something goes up in brightness, goes down in brightness, and never returns. Or it can be a variable star where things kind of go up and down in brightness forever, for millions of years at least. And so the idea is to, to make sense of all these data. The data can also uh, be either multi-band photometry, where you have uh, simultaneous, simultaneous time series in different photometric bands, or single band time series. Uh, often the problems uh... Alright, thanks John. So, as John says, I'm uh, in the Center for Time Domain Informatics here, and first wanted to thank everyone for coming to our conference. I think it's been a huge success getting people from different domains together to talk about all these interesting problems and see the areas of overlap. Uh, so I just want you know, last talk of the conference, I want to tell a little bit more about what we're working on here. 